Now, today we're going to talk about something which is quite dry on the surface, but also kind of unavoidable. Time and time again, people have come to me and mentioned the tension between things like product, R&D, OSPO, talking with IP or legal. And quite often, it's like two different worlds collide. So we're going to dig into this a little bit, and we're going to come at it from the strategy of, if you're from the open source or product or R&D side, how do you talk to legal? What's the type of strategy that might be useful to have? Now, some context about myself, so you can understand the 20 years-ish I've had in this field and how that might relate to having conversations like this in the past. Uh, I entered open source focused on license compliance, so I set up the legal department and a legal network, the Software Foundation Europe, which was based in Germany, of course, but I was based in the Swiss office. And we had some wonderful connections as for the first time, legal counsel around Europe began to network in an open source manner, in-house and outside counsel. Around 2007, the network set up. 2008, we began to have conferences and a, a great dialogue was built, a lot of it around things like license compliance, but fundamentally, IPR management and open source. I helped co-found the first law journal and the first dedicated law book focused on open source legal matters. On the first hand, it was about, in the journal, covering all types of topics of interest to counsel. You know, what happened on product side, what happened on standard side. With the law book, it was a country-by-country -country analysis of, in certain countries, what type of laws constrain open source from the perspective of IP. Later, I was a director of licensing at OIN. This was a switch to dealing with the patent side of IP and working on getting companies to, in this case, pledge patent non-aggression around the Linux system. Today, I'm running the OpenChain project, which is a project building standards for open source process management. And our focus is very much on license compliance and more recently, security assurance. And we, we build ISO standards around this. We also build reference material and so on. So quite a lot of stuff around intellectual property, a lot of stuff around copyright and open source, and in the last seven years, a lot of stuff around if you're formalizing your approach to open source IP, formalizing your approach to open source process management, or what do you do? Interlude, by the way, today Nokia just announced that they have adopted our ISO standard for open source license compliance. I think I saw Mark Etion at the back there. He's the chair of Telco, he's Nokia, and he's awesome. Well done, Nokia. <laughs> Alrighty, how to talk to open source people, how to talk to IP people, how to get a dialogue running. It's an interesting challenge. I have noticed over the years a lot of adversity between the two sides. Um, and I think that's because the departments in play often have different performance goals. They have a very different role in a company. Product and R&D is trying to build something new. OSPOs are trying to integrate open source into a company. IP is con constraining risk, mostly. And the other side is leveraging portfolios for potentially profit or negotiation. And those are very different worlds. So if we're thinking about how to talk to IP, we have to think about a, a strategy that speaks to what they're up to. Uh, there's no real point in telling the IP department open source is great because we can collaborate. That's not their job. Their, their job is to make sure nothing horrible happens and or what is created is leveraged for value. So starting out talking to something like an IP department, I'd say one of the ways that's really productive is, is to point out that open source is a proven way for co-developing platforms. Okay, so it's a well-known, established, and not scary way to do this, especially from the perspective of IP licensing. There's well over two decades of pedigree in getting this done and getting it done without catastrophic problems. The business benefit for consumers of open source 
is essentially that the company gets access to platform technology. And it would be very costly and time inefficient to go and build that in-house or impossible. And the benefit for distributors of open source is essentially forming a codependent relationship with other parties and driving down R&D costs. So on one hand, instead of having to build 100% of something yourself, uh, you can take a lot of the platform from others and only build a small amount. On the other hand, instead of maintaining a platform, you can put it out there and co-develop with others, driving down R&D cost. All of that with the proven IP licensing. That sets the context for this isn't crazy, stupid, or weird. And then you can talk about how open source licensing itself is a two-way street. You know, on one hand, by following the licenses, which are proven, uh, you can leverage third-party IP. And interestingly, in this case, you can leverage quite valuable third-party IP without entering into individual contractual relationships, additional cost centers, and so on. And then on the other side, if the company chooses to release IP, internal IP, and benefit from reduced R&D costs, open source is a strategy that's battle proven. So you can consume third party IP with minimal risk and low cost, and you can also release IP with a well-known battle-tested approach. So that two-way street indicates that open source licensing itself can be a very simple and sensible mechanism. Now, to accomplish benefit in this space, um, we need to understand how a company's open source dependence and its terms are working today. In other words, what are you using internally today? How much of your stuff is open source? What are the licenses and so on? Part of that is a question that belongs with, let's say, the engineering team. You know, what are we doing, blah, blah, blah. But if you think about the IP perspective, part of that is assessing how much have we already bought into this in practice? What type of IP strategies are we using in practice today? From understanding where you're at today, you can begin to talk about how do you increase benefit, essentially following the IP path that's already underway in the company, and continue to minimize risk exposure. Good example, if you're following the logic on the, the thinking here, you know, the licenses are battle proven, we're already using GPL and Apache, we can therefore expand our use of GPL and Apache without worrying too much. In a broad sweep, it's a smaller sell than saying, I'm coming in with a brand new IP approach, please panic now. Uh, and, and then there's the, you know, the specific activity where you want to understand the cost and the benefit of specific licensing choices. Uh, and that's something that really is very important when considering releasing your own IP. One thing that I have noticed in the past would be, for instance, an R&D department saying, we've developed something cool, uh, it, it isn't a product, and we want to release it. We'd like to use X license. And you try and send that to IP with no context, uh, basically their job is to say no. But if you give them the context that we're already using this type of licensing internally, this licensing will not affect other parts of our portfolio because it's a known quantity, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, <clears throat> it's a language they understand. Now, one of the most important things is risk. And the known risks around open source uh, are something that you really have to lean into, I think, when talking to IP, given that this is their primary job. Uh, and it's actually a useful part of the conversation in converting an IP department from, let's say, doubtful that product and R&D and the OSPO is sensible with IP into believing that these parties get it, that we have to be very cautious while taking the benefit of platform. One of the important things here is, you know, failing to follow someone else's IP licenses is a serious issue, no matter how you cut it. Proprietary licenses, open source licenses, whatever. 
And when it comes to open source and IP strategy, you need a remediation strategy. What do you do when things go wrong? And that, that's you know, something that's going to come up. Things will go wrong. Uh, and the good news is, in open source, we do have remediation strategies very visible because we're many years into doing this. We've done it a long time. You can find them pretty much everywhere, including, for example, in the open chain repositories. You can see how people deal with external contacts and make sure that you can have approaches to communicating when there's a, a license compliance issue. Another important strategy for IP is when someone fails to follow the licenses you're using. You release code under, let's say, the GPL. Someone takes the code and doesn't follow the GPL license. You need a correction strategy for that. Um, and even if it's code that fundamentally has no value to, let's say, the R&D department, they made something, they released it, the IP department needs to have a strategy for dealing with the fact that corporate IP is being misused. So you work with them on that strategy. And then, of course, an important and increasingly important topic, uh, license changes, bait and switch. You're using code and suddenly it's gone. It's, it's now under a license that has nothing to do with the agreed strategy. And that's a case of thinking very carefully about the parties that you rely on. And it's also a case of thinking very carefully about the dependency you have. Um, and again, that's a normal part of the IP portfolio management that the company has. Um, it's just one of those things where perhaps OSPOs and IP don't share a common language. Another thing I think that's useful is given all of this context that you're able to speak the language of where IP might be in their concerns, to move on to the purpose of the open source teams or advocates in the company. For if everything is as I just said, it basically maps to current IP department thinking. They might say, okay, that's great. Uh, we now get how to manage the licenses, that's fine. You have to explain then, of course, why you're there now and why you'll be there tomorrow and why this bridging is important. One is the knowledge center for open source because, of course, the licenses and the IP containment is only a mechanism to get access to the platforms. So the open source people, they're a knowledge bridge into what is valuable and what's not, what open source we want to engage with and what we don't as opposed to trying to distill it down too far into just saying something like, the Apache license is fine, go yonder, which it isn't a good IP strategy. Another important point for purpose, for the people in this room and in this conference, is bridging to the community norms and communication. If you depend on third-party IP in this space, you depend on the community, and you have to know how to talk with it. Uh, the IP department, their speciality is generally not communication with community participants. So the open source people are vital. And finally, there's something which I think has been highlighted very well by Amazon, and also Volvo recently, uh, internal change agents, and having a way for the company as a whole to increasingly benefit from shared platforms. So I heard from Nidia at Amazon a while back about the way they scaled their OSPO by having um, open source champions in every department around Amazon. And uh, Mary from Volvo, who's just there, also did the same at Volvo. And it's a multiplier because that means that all across the company you end up with people who can do the communication, who can do the bridging, who have the knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Interaction with the IP team it continues to be important at all times. Even if you understand the licenses and you understand why there's an OSPO or an open source expert, you have to continually ensure that the company strategy and the open source strategy align. Uh, one example, if a company is trying to maximize its hold on its IP because of bad market conditions, and R&D is used to just flinging out anything that doesn't look like a product, that's not alignment. So you have to make sure the company 
and the open source strategy align to make sure that you're going to continue working together well. And then open source risk management strategies that align with the broader IP risk in the company. And, and that means thinking beyond, you know, is this a risky project using a risky license in open source? It means thinking about things like, hypothetical here, are companies developing a super secret AI source? Do we want to enter into XYZ area of open source AI? That's a big topic. Uh, and you have to think about that very carefully with IP and risk management. Finally, uh, the open source risk containment processes, I think, is a good one to think of as the last key thing with the IP team. The IP team, there was a joke a lawyer made that you know, lawyers, legal teams, IP teams, basically their ideal world is to have everyone sitting at a desk quietly, hands pam up, doing nothing. That's basically accomplishing their main KPI that nothing bad happens. And it, it's a tough job. Uh, so implementing a risk containment process, which sounds like we're going to not use open source, doesn't mean that. It means saying to IP, if and when we need to contain open source risk across the scale, here's how we do it. Here are the ways we can approach that. And you, know, you can push that down to zero engagement or try to, or we can maximize it, but here's a path, here's a way. And that avoids ending up in a situation where someone's saying, this is great, and IP's saying no. Uh, and you, you have a negotiation. Right, so the end goal of all of this is to try to ensure that IP accomplishes their actual goal of managing risk related to intellectual property. But at the same time, the company does obtain maximum benefit from third-party platform technology and development resources. So it's, it's this nuanced balance, and that conversation, approaching it in this manner, I think has proven useful over the years. In many ways, it means going straight to the table of IP and saying, we get it, risk containment, let's talk about how we could lock this down. And then saying, now you know how we can lock it down all the way if you need it, but here's all the reasons we, we shouldn't, and here's all the ways we can manage this spectrum. Right, uh, final thing, as a by the way, uh, you can send your IP people to this conference and we'll educate them for you. <laughs> the Open Compliance Summit happens yearly in, in Tokyo. And uh, it's a closed door conference of about 100 to 120 people capped under Chatham House rule <coughs> that allows lawyers and other legal experts to sit down and talk about stuff like risk management, Stuff like what they're really worried about, which includes finding out that engineering is doing something loopy and they've no idea how that could have occurred in the company. So it's a great place to go. And one of the good things about this event, I think, is you'll meet some of the most experienced people in open source risk management. Or, and I'm joking here, Harold, because this is recorded, open source risk causing. Uh, our opening keynote this year is Harold Velte who started gplviolations.org and was the first person to prove open source licenses in court alongside Dr. Till Yeager, his lawyer. Uh, so you know, people like that, who 20 years ago changed open source licensing from probably it's okay into legally here are the boundaries, are at this conference to speak and uh, hang out. Alrighty, okay. So this talk, quite short, quite compact, partially coherent, intended to give you a taste of the type of language that I've found personally useful discussing with IP departments how we approach this stuff. Avoiding all of the things about vague benefit or maybe ifs and going straight to we know your job is to put out fires. You can put out fires here. Don't worry about it but we'd love to be able to get these platforms. I hope it was a little bit useful. I'm happy to talk more. And if there's any question from the audience, I believe I have a few moments before the next speaker. Thank you very much.
Oh gosh. Okay. You were first and then you're next. You can have one. Hi. Um, as you know, our open source world is getting more and more complicated because now policymakers are very much, you know, aware of open source and want to get involved. So that's going to impact. So, so our open source practice is not just going to be one for all, right? It's going to sometimes can be region specific, especially we are talking about AI stuff too. So, um, one, how should our legal team tackle this? Number two, is there any a support group that they can because the information changing on daily basis. Is there any kind of a forum that they can go to and ask their peers for support? Yeah, good questions. Uh, yes and yes. Uh, the first thing I think is that we can't pretend that there's one solution by any measure. In the early days of open source, a lot of people um, sort of assumed that US norms on legal matters would prevail. Uh, and I remember Professor Eben Moglen, hey Eben talking about the way that people who had signed into the copyright treaty around the world would essentially then follow what the open source licenses said due to the jurisdiction uh, of the US being the place of the licenses. This is not legal advice. Again, hey, Eben. Uh, but basically everywhere has its own laws. And if you're here in Vienna, if you're nearby in, let's say, Stuttgart, you're dealing with civil law rather than common law. And there's authorship as well as copyright. So you have to deal with it on a regional basis. And this means there's no one size fits all. Good news, there are forums to deal with this and communicate with peers. One would be the Linux Foundation Legal Summit, which is happening in mid-November in Napa. So you can send your legal team to learn and drink. Uh, there's also the FSFE Legal Network, which is based in Europe. Um, and that's another space where council can chat about stuff. And um, of course, that. So, you know, you have basically two or three main conferences around the world. You have some mailing lists. But there isn't a one size fits all here. Uh, the fact is that with the variance, uh, the best thing to do is to continually network in the regions at events such as this. Uh, the U.S. Member Summit is good. The event we have in Tokyo is good. The FSFE legal event every year is good. But I think also coming to these events more often is useful. And, you know, we, we, we have a diversity of people just in this room. Like I see Jory, the VP of Standards from LF right there, <laughs> uh, who are kind of the people you want to catch in the corner at the hallway track. So I'm afraid it's not one size fits all, but I do have good news. Uh, the Open Chain project, which I run, is very global, and we have work groups uh, across the world. So, for example, you can connect with those, not just with your legal people, but also your open source people, and they can network as well with companies in the region. So that's a, an avenue, one of many. Uh, next question, I believe. Uh, thank you. Bruce Tullock's my name. Um, speaking from a perspective of infrastructure companies, energy companies, users of IP, some time developers of IP, you spoke a lot about the tension and dialogue between legal and R&D and pre-product and wanting to release and take advice, all the stuff you're talking about within a single company. Can you speak more to how the Linux Foundation, through these sorts of initiatives, might um, defang the, the risk in the minds of legal across many companies that seek to collaborate. And I'm speaking here specifically in the energy sector with the move to decarbonisation and a, a need to interoperate much more. They recognise the need to share IP, but they're also pulling in companies with patent portfolios. They're looking at brand licensing pools. Can you speak to the initiatives and how business with with that interest can engage with the Linux Foundation through these sorts of initiatives to um, progress faster than they are now? What a thorny question. <laughs> Did Exxon Mobile send you? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. So uh, the, the key thing there is that Linux Foundation is a very big thing. So I can't speak to LF as a whole. But I can tell you that initiatives like Open Chain Project are solving for a, a challenge identified by companies. So if you want to envision the Linux Foundation as uh, an organization, it should be very clearly understood as an umbrella. 
and the projects are set up by the member companies, which then solve for a shared challenge. So one example would be LF Energy, which is trying to bring together the energy companies to talk about what do we need to do. And I know you know this, <laughs> and you brought the question on purpose, which is a great question, because in energy, the portfolio management is epic. You know, the, the sheer investment of cost is perhaps second to or equal to uh, medical side. So people have to be very cautious on IP. And uh, then moving into the new area of things like decarbonization is a tremendous long-term investment. Does the Linux Foundation provide an avenue to talk about that? Absolutely. The solution obtained won't be a Linux Foundation solution in the same way that Open Chain Project isn't a Linux Foundation solution. The companies came together, they built a project, and they found a solution. So, yeah, LF Energy, I think, can and will and continue to be relevant in, in where you are. And it is fantastic that so many energy companies, such as yourselves, are investing time in this domain to talk this through. In our case, companies with the supply chain issue of license compliance came together and said, what can we do together? What can we do as a community? And Linux Foundation was able to provide that. Again, unfortunately, these are such complex issues, we're never gonna have a silver bullet. So, you know, in LF, we'll have many projects addressing many problems, but there won't be a one-stop shop to say, here's how you do open source and portfolio management. It will really depend. Yeah, it's like, it's complex. <laughs> but, the, the, I mean, the good news is that, and this is where, you know, Nokia's work, Marketon's work, with the SBOM guide that Telco just released, is that one industry can do something to solve for IP management that then inspires others. So the SBOM guide for Telco, which is now operationalized, in fact, last week, Nokia released a validator for that guide of SBOM quality. The SBOM study group is now looking at how to make that cross industry. So that's Kubota-san from Sony right there. And his meeting on the 25th will look at the telco solution and say, if SBOM quality is a problem in telco that's been at least partially solved, can we put that across cross industry? So I'm hoping in LF Energy, as you guys work out the, let's say the patent portfolio side, which is super important, uh, that can inspire others. So that's what I hope we do. Yeah. I was in Brussels a week ago for the LF Energy Conference and we did discuss this, but I wanted to go to the, the source of open change. To, to ask the question. To the yeah. I spent a lot of time with Shuli when she was running LF Energy and she invited Open Chain to talk several times there. And I was really heartened by where that conversation is going. 20 years ago, almost, tel uh, not telco, mobile companies were talking about Linux distros before Android took over. And one of their big blockers was patents. And they just couldn't work out how to negotiate a, a shared play pool. And then, of course, Google steamrolled the market by making a solution that just worked, which was smart. Um, and I, I think the lesson learned is that we do have to work out how to share the IP. And uh, probably you guys are going to be leading that. Good luck. No pressure. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just can't even conceive of the investment capital, hundreds of billions in this decarbonization in the near term. And you, you just can't go to a, a portfolio management perspective and think we'll release all of this. You have to think, how do I get that minimal back and the shareholders? Never forget, everyone, if a company's on the market, they have to return shareholder value. It's the law. <laughs> so they, they literally have to work out how do we make this money back plus profit. That's the starting point, which you guys know. Alrighty, any final question? Because I'm eating all of Kawada San's time. <laughs> he forgives me, he's part of Open Chain. Alrighty, thank you very much. I'm always available. <laughs>